Hello everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, very unique uh, series that I'll be making. Uh, this will be on uh, the World Championship, upcoming World Championship match between uh, the World Champion Magnus Carlsen and the challenger Ian Nepomniachtchi. The concept here is uh, we'll be going through some of their games and um, try to make some sort of conclusion on their strength, weaknesses, uh, the psychological aspect, uh, what are the chances and so on. I made a um, lot of research on this and uh, I was thinking which game to start with and you know how to make this video. So the first thing is of course we know there is a huge difference in style when it comes to these two players. It's totally opposite and as they say personality develops at the very young age. I thought the best starting point for us would be to take a look at their game which were their first game. In World Under 12, uh, they played in Spain. It's actually uh, fascinating to observe how from a very early age, they more or less had the similar kind of style which is still continuing. So the basic really did not change much. In fact, I could sell this game saying that, uh, you know, it has been played by two very strong players who are already grandmasters and matured. Without further delay, let's uh, jump into the game. Uh, the very first game in World Under 12 uh, Spain, Nepomniachtchi is white and uh, Magnus Carlsen is black. So the very first game it continues with uh, e4, Alekhain. Something that again has not changed as such, uh, Magnus is uh, capable of playing anything and everything. Throughout his career it was like that, which still continues obviously. So we get uh, a normal uh, Alekhain uh, setup with uh, g6. I would say here uh, it's more natural uh, nowadays to play castle and uh, bishop b3 and then try to get some sort of c4. The move Nepo played is also very uh, human, knight c3, targeting on uh, d5 of course black can never take because of uh, mate on f7. So he goes bishop e6, short castle, knight d7. Now it is not very often that we see in world under 12, uh, you know, players playing Alekhain defense and that too, this particular setup. So it's also kind of unique uh, in Magnus's play. I want to pause at this point and um, draw attention of the following sequence. So here Magnus shows uh, tremendous understanding by forcing a series of exchange and getting into a slightly favorable position for black, which is again uh, his typical uh, strength. So he takes on e5. White has to take, there is just no, no other option, so white takes back. And now he takes on c3 too. This is under attack and at this point we should note that bishop into e6 would have been very nice uh, to force f into e6 but that is not going to happen because there is a small tactic, knight e2 check, uh, fork and we cannot take because of uh, back rank mate. Hence white is forced to play queen takes c3. Now bishop into c4, queen into c4. And very important move, queen d5. So with the help of this little tactic, the strategic play was in action. And now we see white has some sort of a dilemma. Would he take here? Because if he does so, black takes. And black gets a half open c file, which is very easy to attack uh, on the c2 pawn. The bishop on g7 is never bad because uh, first of all, it tar targets on e5. If you push e6, then again, subsequently, both these pawns will be weak. And after change, if you try to maintain the position by playing f4, at right appropriate moment, uh, black will anyway uh, break free himself or he could first play e6 and then get rook fc8 and start playing for uh, the c2 pawn. So black has no problem here, white goes queen e2, uh, nepo does not want, uh, didn't want to exchange queens. Rook a d8 happen and after bishop g5 attacking on e7, again uh, very nice piece play at this point. Magnus goes queen e6, wanting to play rook d5 and again targeting the e5 pawn. A very special moment occurs after queen e3. This one is actually a very mature decision for a kid. I don't know if we can call, you know, 12 years old, under 12 uh, years old a kid anymore because nowadays people become, people are becoming grandmaster by that age. But in any case, if we follow the rule book typically, then we would play probably a6, yeah, keeping the pawns on a different color. Uh, than our bishop. But it turns out that black has a weakness and white also has a weakness. So this means when uh, black plays a6, 
White can play a move like queen b3, kind of forcing this. And after the exchange, this is very likely to fizzle out because suddenly the pawn on e7 becomes more prominent and uh, the pawn on e5 uh, is uh, less like to, likely to get attacked. So foreseeing this, Magnus goes b6. It's a very interesting decision, I must say. A very strong decision, actually. Because this time, queen b3, there is a possibility of rook d5. Now we see this pawn is uh, not weak anymore, while the pawn on e5 is kind of weaker. So after b6, uh, Jan goes a4, trying to get some sort of uh, a5 in. Rook d5, attacking on e5. And after bishop f4, not the routine move rook fd8. This would have been, you know, the, the kind of hand move that uh, typically a player can make. But then a5. And suddenly the pawn on a7 uh, comes under attack. So instead of this, Magnus plays the following. He first plays queen f5. Avoiding uh, any kind of a5 business by keeping an eye on c2. And only after queen e4, now that white has moved, he goes back to d7. So, small details, but we can already see from a very early age uh, how these players were playing. Magnus on one hand, we will see this number of times, incredibly strong when it comes to this, this kind of strategic uh, play. Nepo on the other hand, very slippery. It's like a fish which is very difficult to catch. So, even though he is getting kind of outplayed, he has his own resources. He is always finding uh, some way to crawl out from his defensive mechanism. So c3 he plays, rook d8 and uh, players are kind of waiting at this point. I would say black consolidated totally. He has got uh, complete control on the d5. e5 is some sort of a weakness. So Nepo waits. And it is at this moment, uh, the first moment where uh, Magnus kind of um, stumbled. Some move like h6 or h5, trying to improve the position further would have been better. Instead, Magnus goes for the move uh, rook d3, which optically looks good, but suddenly white does not need the queen on this diagonal to play a5 because the rook has moved from d5. So, Nepo grabs its chance immediately. So, he creates counter on the queen side. And after b5, a very interesting variation could have been bishop e3 attacking on a7. I guess both of them saw a3 and they must have seen bishop d4 because this is pretty logical. And a6 black kind of had to play. If rook d7, bishop d4, this I believe both the players would have considered as an improvement for white, which is true. So bishop e3, a6 and now the move bishop d4. Queen f5 is forced to protect the rook. g4 attacking the queen. And maybe, it's my speculation, maybe they left it here. Kind of saying uh, this is under attack and uh, after king g2, black has rook d3. But that's not the case. Uh, white has a fantastic move here to play rook a d1, sacrificing this pawn, but then shutting the rook completely and penetrating from the d file. So most likely either one rook will get changed or uh, if black moves the rook somewhere, then rook d7 happens very quickly. So this was a chance that white had. Uh, Nepo remains also true to his style. He goes uh, for a6, uh, fixing this and keeping winning chances. So although they uh, might have missed this particular combination, but uh, Nepo uh, smells blood already and he goes for a very direct uh, approach. So c5, queen e4. And once again, uh, a little bit of a weird decision, I might say. It's not fair to criticize a 12-year-old kid for playing queen d5 here. But uh, since we are talking about a future world champion, what I did not get was uh, the fact that he was trying to avoid queen exchange for all this time. Why did he choose it at this point? Because still rook 8 d5 would have given him a better position. So this was a wrong judgment. Probably in Magnus point of view, he felt uh, uh, after the exchange, uh, a position like this uh, is still fine for black. Which is actually true, black is not in danger, but uh, you know, if we did not change the queens, if we had just played rook 8 d5, it would still keep some sort of an advantage. Rook a5 happened, c4, and now white basically has one very important target and that is on a7. So suddenly this bishop feels more valuable than the bishop on g7. 
in the game king f1 happened e6 and we got to a position like this when nepo comes up with rook b1 a natural move uh, once we see uh, b3 is coming as i was saying like uh, it doesn't feel like two kids are playing it feels like you know some really serious uh, games are going on at a pretty decent level and here uh, something happened that again we will see uh, a number of times actually magnus pressing very hard to win the game he avoids uh, specifically at this point if he was playing for a draw if he wanted a draw he could have got that with bishop c5 it's such a direct move and uh, white must take and we take here now either rook d5 rook d5 c d4 or rook b8 check rook d8 takes takes we get to this position which is likely to fizzle out uh, and the upcoming result is more or less certain that this will end in a draw instead magnus tries something um, something that is unusual bishop e7 a very surprising decision extremely surprising decision why would you not uh, change the bishop at this point when it is obvious that the bishop on uh, uh, bishop on d4 is much stronger than the bishop on e7 and look at the pawn on a7 which is kind of a direct target so this we will also see in number of games when uh, magnus kind of overpresses and uh, then nepo grabs uh, the chance so nepo immediately played b3 opening up the position here uh, black had a fascinating uh, defense i would uh, ask all the readers to uh, the viewers to pause at this point and try to figure out uh, how would you survive here as black uh, take like 10 minutes or so uh, assuming you have uh, taken uh, 10 minutes and hopefully you figured out the draw the key here is that we want to exchange the bishop but bishop c5 would run into b into c4 and we cannot take back because our bishop is hanging hence the brilliant move was to play bishop b4 absolutely uh, spectacular move if c takes b4 we take and after rook king to b4 there is c3 black is creating enough uh, counter if after bishop b4 uh, black white would go rook a2 now we play uh, c takes b3 attacking the rook and then finally play bishop c5 changing the uh, bishop but uh, of course psychologically a player who did not play bishop c5 at this point is less likely to play bishop b4 and then bishop c5 after white has played b3 and of course the idea of bishop e7 was to get the bishop to d8 which is what magnus did and now after uh, rook to a2 it kind of becomes uh, impossible to hold the position probably still the best defense was to take take so black's main problem is black can never play bishop b6 anymore we just take and play a7 so the bishop on b4 becomes super strong here maybe black could play something like f6 ef6 king f7 try to get some sort of uh, e5 but uh, still here also it feels like white is uh, likely to win the game in the game uh, magnus took on d4 c takes d4 and c3 trying to fix the pawn but of course nepo doesn't allow that he plays b4 himself and after bishop g5 trying to get the bishop to d2 is also not enough because uh, at this point if black would play bishop d2 we just take and this rook pawn end game is uh, devastating because of the pawn on a6 and black is unable to move the rook due to d5 break so rook d1 happened and uh, magnus played uh, rook c7 threatening bishop trying to get bishop d2 i cannot even call it a threat anymore but in any case uh, after rook c2 this time if bishop d2 we just play king e2 and then eventually uh, take the pawn and win this rook pawn end game so magnus played bishop e7 d5 at the right moment uh, if black takes then we take and take on b5 magnus took on b4 but after d6 rook c8 uh, rook b1 magnus resigned so there is just no way to save the b5 pawn this pawn will eventually queen so a very exciting game kind of strategic magnus slowly outplayed nepo but then nepo as we will see number of times he is very slippery is very very tricky i must say and um, he kind of escapes this is the this is the first game uh, we'll see a number of games we'll also see some uh, rapid games and uh, as we as the series unfolds uh, we will uh, draw some conclusion what are the upsides what are the downsides for each players 
and i ho i hope uh, all of you will be uh, enjoying this uh, very unique series i personally uh, loved going through uh, all their games and selected a few for this particular series which i felt uh, will be uh, extremely interesting of course we already know that uh, nepo is one of the rare rarest player who has got a very good plus score against the world champion uh, nepo won uh, four games in in classical chess and magnus had won only one game uh, so yeah looking forward to seeing all of you for uh, the remaining part of this series thank you